The conditions which existed prior to the accident were, the aircraft was returning from a routine mission and had descended to 6,000 feet for normal GCA approach. When the aircraft was 500 feet above the ground, the GCA controller instructed the pilot to execute a go-round. At this time, the pilot was flying the aircraft. Flaps and landing gear were down and locked. Weather conditions at time of accident were 500 foot ceiling, one and a half mile visibility. There was light snow with a surface wind of 10 knots from 330 degrees. Surface temperature was plus six degrees Fahrenheit. The conditions during the emergency were acceleration on go round was slow. Pilot noted lack of thrust on engines one, two, and five. The aircraft commander assumed control. Gear was retracted and air starts attempted on flamed out engines without success due to drop in fuel flow. The aircraft commander attempted to reach the field on the remaining engines with gear down and flaps up. In his turn to final, his airspeed was 155 knots, dropping to 140 and last reported 132 prior to crash. The airplane stalled in and crashed approximately 3,000 feet from the end of the runway. The resulting fire destroyed the aircraft with the exception of both outboard wing sections, the empennage, and six of the eight engines. The inspection after the accident revealed mushy ice throughout the fuel system, still intact because of the exceptionally low surface temperature and the fact that several of the engines were not burned in the crash. One quarter inch of solid ice was found covering 60% of the engine-driven fuel pump strainer. Chips of ice on the bottom of the strainer completed the job of effectively blocking the pump. It was concluded that the loss of power which resulted in the accident was due to fuel starvation caused by icing in the aircraft fuel system. What you have just seen and heard is a summary of the accident investigation of an actual B-52 crash that took place at Ellsworth Air Force Base, 11 February, 1958. Peculiar climatic circumstances made possible this tragic documentation of the deadly effects of contaminated fuel. In many other accidents, near accidents and aborts, we know that fuel system failure due to contaminated fuel has been the principal cause. This destruction of trained men and multi-million dollar aircraft because of a few pints of water or a few spoonfuls of dirt can and must be stopped. This picture will show you how. Feeding time for a bird that costs eight and a half million dollars, flies 650 miles an hour, carries under its wings the deterrent power that can keep the peace. Like an army, it travels on its stomach, fed by the fuel that makes possible its global range. Fuel that must be clean and dry. Like contaminated food, contaminated fuel can kill. The eight jet engines that drive this huge bird hungrily consume fuel at a rate unheard of in propeller-driven aircraft, and they are fed through a delicate, complex digestive tract. The lines lead from every fuel reservoir that the designer could find room for, down to the engines with their close-tolerance fuel controls. Along the way are booster pumps and transfer valves, each protected by fine mesh filter screens. Clean, dry fuel flows easily through this system, leaving screens clean, valves and pumps unworn. But foreign particles in the fuel, rust or dirt or any one of a thousand kinds of dust, pile up against the screens and clog them. These particles may be too small to be seen without magnification, much smaller than the diameter of a human hair. 
Nevertheless, this microscopic dirt can so impede the flow of fuel that engines may literally starve to death, killed by contaminants. A far more sinister threat to the proper nourishment of our first-line jet aircraft is a usually harmless liquid called water. Jet fuel is thirsty stuff. It absorbs water from many sources, holds it in tiny droplets called entrained water. Water is safe enough in its liquid state at low altitudes and moderate temperatures. But when temperatures drop, as in cold weather or high altitude operations, the droplets freeze into ice. When this jet fuel highball starts to move through the complex, close tolerance fuel system, the nuggets of ice, which come up against the filter screens, rapidly form an ice barrier. Onboard fuel systems cannot survive the icing or clogging that results from jet fuel contamination. Unless every gallon delivered into the aircraft is clean and dry, engines lose power and eventually flame out from lack of fuel. Contaminated fuel can kill. P.O.L. Police on guard against this killer. Prevention and elimination of fuel contamination on every Air Force base rests with the men of P.O.L. Petroleum Oil Lubrication Specialists. Recognition is the first step in keeping deadly contaminated fuel out of jet aircraft. How does clean dry fuel look? It is bright and clear, ranging from colorless to amber. You can read ordinary newsprint clearly through it. Now, how does contaminated fuel look? Generally, contamination from foreign solids is visible to the naked eye. Tiny foreign particles in suspension cloud and dirty the sample. Heavier foreign matter sinks to the bottom of the sample as sediment. Otherwise invisible particles can be made visible by slowly rotating the sample bottle. They will concentrate as an easily seen dark mass at the center of the vortex. Fuel dangerously contaminated by solids can be detected by careful and frequent visual samplings. But fuel must not only be clean, it must be dry. Dry fuel, like clean fuel, is bright and clear. You can read ordinary newsprint through a sample bottle of it. Fuel containing free water is clear too, but the large drops of water that adhere to the sides of the sampling bottle are obvious danger signals. So is the free water, which later settles to the bottom of the fuel sample. A more treacherous type of free water is the entrained type. This is suspended in the fuel as tiny droplets. Fortunately, it signals its presence by making the fuel sample cloudy. Sometimes water and fuel combine so completely as to form an emulsion. This too may cloud the sample or appear as a stringy mass called lace. Make frequent visual examinations while on the job. Know how to take samples and what to look for in them. Be ready and able to detect deadly contaminated fuel and to start the action that will keep it out of our aircraft. Backing up your informed skill may be a simple but effective on-base testing setup or the larger facilities of an Air Force Petroleum Laboratory. Visual examination can warn of contamination to trained POL specialists. Laboratory analysis can determine the degree of contamination. The Carl Fisher titration does this for total water content. Solid contaminants, even of microscopic size, are filtered out by a millipore filter and weighed with an analytical balance.
Besides these quantitative verifications of visual examinations, any base can make other simple periodic checks, such as detecting sulfate-reducing bacteria in the free water from storage tanks. These bacteria, if unchecked, could make the stored fuel dangerously corrosive. On-the-job training prepares for individual responsibilities. One more thing is necessary if fuel contamination is to be prevented or eliminated. The POL specialists whose service today's high consumption, close tolerance jet aircraft with types of fuel easily contaminated must have improved types of fuel handling and filtering equipment to do their jobs.